There's no number of Facebook likes that will bring you contentment. There is no extravagant Valentine's gift from your sweetie that will bring you this kind of contentment. There's no new Xboxes or cash or cars or whatever That's going to bring you this kind of contentment. No relationship, no person who can give you the contentment that is supposed to only be found in Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today. This is Contemplate, the podcast ministry of Acts Church in Camas, Washington. Our teacher is Pastor David Robinson, and I'm Ron Hagelgans. It's great to have you along today for part 10 in our series, Contentment in Christ. Pastor David is going to be talking a lot about stuff today, all the things that we try so hard to get or achieve or do to try and make us happy. And the truth is, it seems like we just bounce from thing to thing, never really getting what we really want. So what's the answer? Well, let's find out. Get out your Bible as we join Pastor David Robinson for today's lesson, recorded live at Acts Church. So, most people want to be rich. I think that we think this, being rich, wealth, all these things are something that we think of as bringing joy, that somehow they bring joy. Most people would not necessarily be joyful with lots of cats or rotten eggs, um, but maybe cars, dollar bills, maybe maybe, uh, diplomas on the wall, maybe uh, the best spouse, maybe whatever it is, whatever is in your heart that you think of that you think would make you rich, maybe that's what you would call it. But somehow at the end of the day, we sort of define rich and wealth as, hey, I'm able to be content all the time. A rich person has more contentment. That's why people envy wealth. They envy it for that reason. On Christmas morning, I used to get a lot of presents from my aunts, my uncles, and grandparents, whatever. And I would open these presents up, and I would have lots of stuff. Some of the stuff I would break within like the first hour, right? I just, you know, it was cheap or I was rough with it or whatever. Some of the stuff lasted longer, but nothing lasted very long to where I was content with that stuff. In fact, if I went into Christmas morning and I was not content, I never came out of Christmas morning and all of a sudden was content because I had more stuff. Because that's not the way contentment works, right? Stuff is not what brings contentment. Stuff is not what, at the end of the day, we really care about. Now, there's a game that people play called Would You Rather? Um, It's basically silly questions where you have two choices, usually both bad, Um, And you have to choose one or the other. Which would you rather have? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of kind of silly ones. Would you rather have a Texas accent and live in New York or a New York accent and live in Texas? (laughs) Would you rather always smell bad to other people or always have everyone else smell bad to you? You got to think about that one for a second. Now, scientists say this is actually true of everyone. So if you're not smelling the people around you, Wait a minute. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Or, or am I? Now you have something to worry about. All right. Listen, now that you understand how the game works, I have a question for you that's more serious, and I want you to think about it, and I want you to think about it as we walk through the rest of the message this morning. Would you rather get everything you want? Anytime you want something, you get it. Or would you rather learn to be happy with what you have? Yeah, I think that there's a, it's almost rhetorical, there's the answer that you should give here, but that's not necessarily the answer that's really in your heart, so I want to work through for a second, or at least it's not the one that's always in our heart, or we don't at least live it out or live that way sometimes. So, it's important because one of these options is actually possible, and not only possible, but fundamental, fundamental to a mature Christ follower. One of these options, you know which one it is. All right, Listen. Uh, For those of you who are old enough to have had the original Nintendo, the original NES system, did you like it? I liked mine, playing Mario and Duck Hunt and Metroid. I loved Metroid, uh, whatever. I actually was old enough to have had an Atari, and I even liked that. Pitfall was amazing. You're jumping on these alligators. Look, Pitfall, Pitfall fans. All right, cool. Um, uh, Yeah, all right. 
I've started something here. I, I don't want to keep going. All right, so here's the thing. They seemed amazing when I first time. I'm like, dude, you can get your little thumb going on the Atari. No, was it that way? I don't know. Anyway, however I was doing it, it seemed amazing. I've got these four-bit graphics or whatever. It's basically squares on a screen, and I think it's incredible. Of course, then the next one comes out. Then the next one comes out. Then the next one comes out. And they get better and better and better to now games that people play are like almost completely real. Okay, and so you look back at the Atari and you say, I would never be content going back to that. But somehow at the time, I was content with it. When HDTV came out, the new plasma screens, and they were like $7,000. If any of you bought them the first year, that's rough because, of course, that TV is worthless now. But they were super expensive at the time, right? And, and when that came out, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And once I started to got my own HDTV and started to watch that, I could never go back to the old standard TV, right? I could never do that. I used to think back in the 80s that those little TVs, little black and white TVs with the antenna, I don't know if any of you had one of those, weighed about five pounds, Black and white, you get an over-the-air signal. I used to think that was the cool. You could take TV with you, right? That's amazing. I now have 4K video in my pocket, right? I do not want to go back to the other thing, right? And speaking of cell phones, you remember the big, chunky brick? But you know the people who had those back in the day were cool. You're like, dude, he's got that big. I mean, he's like this, carrying it. But like he's got that. He's, that's, that guy is for real. Or the car phone, right? Like, like, oh, he's got the car phone. And I'm, you know, paying 10 bucks a minute so that everyone you call, you can say, hey, guess where I'm calling you from, right? You remember those days, those of you who are old enough. All right. None of those things would make us content now because we have this stuff, right? We have these. And 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it'll be even more. It'll be even something else. And we'll look back and it's like, I would never carry one of these around. Oh my gosh. I could never be content with that. But at the time... Most of us, most of us who couldn't even afford those things, would, have, would think in our minds we would have been more than content. More than content if we had just had those things that were the latest, the greatest. Because everything told us, all the advertisements, all the people, all whatever said, if you have this, you're going to be happy, content, popular, famous, whatever. That's what we thought, right? Now, you would probably not be the most popular guy if you were carrying around a black and white five-pound TV and a brick phone. People would probably be like, either, that guy's retro, man, that's sweet. We're in Portland, so I don't know, but might be that way. Or they might be like, wow, did you just wake up from 1985, right? We wouldn't think that they'd make us content. Now, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that something that could make us completely content at one time, nothing has happened except for the passing of time and the invention of some new stuff, and now because there's a comparison to make, we're no longer content with the things that we would have been content with. Why don't we stay content? When you first met your best friend or your spouse, you wanted to be with that person all the time. It didn't matter what their flaw was, they're passing gas, and you're just like, it's the most, it's cute. Whatever, right? It was, I just want to be around this person. I'm just so in love and what, whatever, right? But then you're with them for a while and where you were completely content, now it's like, eh, I need some alone time, right? Or I should have listened to my mother about you, David. I'm sorry. That was... Why? Um, no, that doesn't happen. Her mother loves me, at least in my face, as far as I know. All right. Um, listen, why is this? Why is this? Why are we content and then we allow ourselves to become discontent? Why does that happen? Because none of these things, okay, and I want you to listen carefully because this is important. Because you know this intellectually, but, but we don't live like this. So listen, none of these things, including but not limited to, as attorneys would say, none of these things, including but not limited to money, stuff, and even relationships, even really important relationships, none of these things, no thing and no person is going to bring you the true contentment that you seek. None of them. Not unless you're already content in the Lord. None of this stuff. Paul and Silas were content even when they were beaten. Even when they were in these tortuous stocks, they'd been violently beaten. 
and they're in the inner prison of Philippi, they were content, not because they were happy with their circumstances, but because their contentment was not tied to their circumstances. Their contentment was not tied to their circumstances. Paul writes a letter to the Philippian church. That's where he is. He's in Philippi. He writes a letter to the Philippian church. That's a really clever name. It's called Philippians. All right. So in this letter, he says this. The Holy Spirit through Paul writes this thing. This is uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 13, if you have your Bible with you. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. The Philippians saw this with Paul. So it's important that you understand that. Because that's who he's writing to. These do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state, whatever my circumstances, right, whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to both be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He says, look, you saw me. I was there. I was in Philippi. You saw what happened to me. You saw how I lived. And one of the things he did, one of the ways he lived when he was in Philippi was he was beaten, tortured, humiliated, and singing hymns. He's saying, do like that. Why? Because when I was with my boy Silas in prison, we were not basing our contentment on the circumstances that we were currently in. Our hope was somewhere else. Our contentment was somewhere else. I was content. As you Philippians know, I was content because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's where my contentment is. Where's my contentment? It's where my heart is. Where is my heart pointed? Toward Christ. Toward Christ. Primarily toward Christ. Listen to what Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be Also, where are our treasures supposed to be? Who are they supposed to be with? They're supposed to be in heaven with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord. There's only only one place where we will find the contentment that the human body, soul, and spirit desire. And that's in Jesus Christ. And only in Jesus Christ. There is no substitute There's no number of Facebook likes that will bring you contentment. There is no extravagant Valentine's gift from your sweetie that will bring you this kind of contentment. There's no new Xboxes or cash or cars or whatever that's going to bring you this kind of contentment. No relationship, no person who can give you the contentment that is supposed to only be found in Jesus Christ. There's nobody. You know what those things are? Those other things that we look to to try to find our contentment? Those things that are not Jesus Christ that we look to and think, this will make me happy? Those things are idols. They're idols. They're functional saviors. They're replacements for God. We replace Jesus when we try to find contentment in things and people and stuff and money and dreams and whatever, if that's where we're looking to be satisfied, we have replaced Jesus Christ with an idol. Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to love me. I love you. Look at all I did. Don't forget that moment when you came to me and you knew your sins were forgiven and you fell on your face, either literally or at least in your heart, and said, oh my God, you love me. It's real. I'm free. You weren't thinking about stuff or even people. You were like, Jesus, it's you and me. I am so happy. I'm free. I'm forgiven. Don't forget your first love. Stay there. If you can stay there, you'll be as content as you always were when you were first there. If you lose it, then you'll start to say, that was great, but I would sure like a new car. That was great, but I want to know that all of my financial stuff will be taken care of forever. I need to have that or I will never feel okay. 
I need to know that my kids will always be safe and nothing bad will ever happen to them. I need to know whatever. I want you to, to answer a question in your mind right now or even write it down on your communication card, not to tear it into me, or an envelope or something. Whatever you need to do to make this, to, to pay attention here, listen to me. Finish this sentence. If I just had blank, I would be happy. Be honest with yourself. It may be one thing. It may be a bunch of things. If I just had blank, I would be happy. Now, let me tell you something. Whatever popped into your mind and your heart, it's an idol. It's an idol. It's a functional savior. That thing is in the place where Jesus should be. Because you should be able to say, all I need is you, Lord. All I need is you. Paul went without physical needs. Not just when I don't get as much. He said he suffered need and was content. Sometimes he didn't have what he needed. Not just what he wanted. What he needed he didn't have. And he was okay with that. It doesn't mean he was happy about it. But he was content and he still had joy because where was his heart pointed? It was pointed towards Jesus. How much time do we waste worrying? Am I good enough? Who do I need to become? Who do I need to make happy? Who do I need to please? Who do I need to save? Who do I need to rescue? Do I have enough stuff? Why do I feel bad? Do I need another this? Do I need another that? Do I need more stability? Do I need my wife or my husband or my friend or my kids to be better? Why do we worry so much about so many things? Why do we waste our time? Why do I waste my time being anxious, wanting things or wanting accomplishments or whatever? Why are we looking for money or promotions or some relationship or some whatever that's going to solve this contentment need when we know intellectually this is not new to you. You know intellectually none of this will satisfy you and yet we constantly go after it. Can those things ever give you what you're looking to them to provide? No. In fact, if your treasure is on earth, if it's in that stuff, instead of in heaven, everything you have. Remember I talked about having lots of cats or having lots of rotten eggs? If you don't have your treasure in heaven, all the treasure that you do have is like rotten cat eggs. I know there's no such thing, but that's what it's like. I'm just telling you what it's like. It's like rotten cat eggs, okay? Paul and Silas had Jesus. They had Jesus. They did not need anything else. They didn't need their own health or comfort or freedom or physical needs. Just Jesus. And they could sing hymns, pray, and sing. I'm not saying that you should not enjoy life and relationships and stuff even. God wants you to have joy in lots of things, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, well, give everything up and go get yourself into prison so you can show that you can have joy in any situation. I'm not saying that. I don't desire that you should suffer, but I do desire that if you suffer, you can still have joy in Christ. I do desire that. God made all these things, all this stuff he made, and part of why he made it was to gladden our hearts and bring us joy. That's good, but he didn't make it to replace him. None of those things were meant to save you. None of those things were meant to make you content. None of those things can save you or make you content. Here's the thing. Listen. Live in the present. Live in the present right now. Slow down. Slow down. Live right now. Don't spend all your energy thinking about what's next or what the next thing is that you want or the next thing that you need or the next thing that you need to worry about. If you want contentment, if you want peace, you need to aim your heart towards Jesus first and ask God for what you need. Again, writing to the Philippians, these folks, Paul says this, it's chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, like singing praises, let your requests may be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You don't understand. You don't know. You're confused. How can I be happy? How can I be content? The peace of God surpasses all of that. And it will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Your soul will be at rest, will be at peace. If you stop being anxious, start letting God know what it is that you need and resting in it. 
Paul modeled what it looks like to be rich to the Philippians. He knew where his treasure was. He knew where it was. He knew who his Savior was. And it wasn't stuff. And it wasn't prestige. And it wasn't pleasing people. And it wasn't any of these things that we get so wrapped up in. It wasn't having everybody think he was great. And it wasn't having lots and lots of stuff. It wasn't being the coolest. None of those things. It was in Jesus. Paul and Silas, their lives, these guys' lives, Paul and Silas' lives were defined by knowing and growing in Christ. And they're going to sing about it, (laughs) no matter what. So live in the present, live today, enjoy everything you have, everything you have. And you will not have as much time to worry about the things that you think you need and the things that you think you want. You have so much more than you normally realize or think about because we're always trying to play one step ahead. We're always thinking about what's next. We're always thinking about what's, what, when the other shoe's going to drop. And we don't sit back and go, wait a second, I got a lot of great things. When we find our contentment in Christ, we get to enjoy All these other things in life, because they're not where we're finding our contentment, so we get to use them for what they're intended to be used for, to gladden our hearts, to give us joy, right? But not to give us our main joy, our main contentment. So if you're after Christ, your heart's on him, you get to enjoy all these other things in life. If your heart is not on him and it's on these things, you'll enjoy neither him nor those things. And what happens when our mind is on these other things? Listen to James Book of James, what the Lord tells us here, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may, be, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Listen, finding your contentment in other things isn't just bad for you. It isn't just going to cause you to have less contentment. It's going to bring sin. It's going to bring sin into your life. Wars, fights, sin, evil, anxiety, fear, death. That's what you have if your focus is this thing or that thing or this thing is going to bring me contentment. And you all know what it's like. You've all been there. If just this thing could happen, if just this thing could happen, you're just obsessed. You're just obsessed. Does it bring you joy? When it happens, it's like, oh, I thought that'd be a bigger deal. I thought that'd be a bigger deal. It really didn't bring me what I thought it would. But you know who never disappoints? is Jesus. Never disappoints. If you'll seek him, you'll find contentment. You know what brings me joy? I'm going to name a few things. And I want you to think about a few things that bring you joy, okay? Watching a sitcom with my wife, just sitting there laughing at something silly. A good worship song, a really good, hot, strong, tasty cup of coffee, a good book, a funny YouTube video, laughter, a conversation. These are things that give me a lot of joy. What's common in all those things? They really don't cost anything. They really don't cost anything. And yet they're the things that if I think, what would I really like to do with my time? That's it. They're not expensive. I want you to experience all that God has for you, but part of that, part of being rich, is recognizing the things that you have, what we call the little things, right? Oh, take pleasure in the little things. We hear it all the time. Do you do it? Do you slow down? Do you enjoy? Do you allow yourself to be content saying, God, thank you for everything that I have, and have that moment be one that's between you and the Lord and praise and thankfulness so that even when things are bad, you still know you have him. There's still joy. We got, to, we got to get this from Paul. And why was Paul able to do it? Because he believed something. What did he believe? What he told us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we also need to understand that without Christ, we can do nothing. Nothing. Nothing of value, nothing important, nothing's going to bring contentment to us or anybody else. None of that's coming outside of the power of the Holy Spirit and a relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's imitate Paul here. Let's find our everything. Let's find our focus. Let's find our contentment and our joy and our faith and our peace and our hope in Christ. 
was Pastor David Robinson from Axe Church in Camas, Washington, and you're listening to Contemplate. I think we all have experienced exactly what Pastor David has been talking about today, working ourselves to death trying to get things that just don't and can't do the trick. It's only as we look to Jesus for our contentment that we find it all. Now, if that's something you'd like to have in your life, but you still have questions or aren't sure what to do next, come see us this Sunday at Axe Church. Let us answer your questions and help you find everything in Christ. And for directions and all the info you need, go to axecamus.org or call 360-885-9000. I'm Ron Hagelgans. Thanks for being here. I do hope you'll come see us this Sunday morning and that you'll listen to the next podcast for more with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate. Contemplate.